Welcome to The Truth In Us Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today, I'm in conversation with a re retired professor of interdisciplinary humanities and the author of the novel, The Second Line, and African Spiritual Traditions in the Novels of Toni Morrison. Please welcome Dr. Coco Zadito Selassie. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Rob. Thank you for coming on. This is totally like a treat. I'm glad we were able to kind of chat a little bit and which which is which is a welcome addition to be able to kind of get a know get to know someone before going into these conversations. Likewise, nice to chat with you. Absolutely. Um so before we get too deep into the the conversation, um we're going to we're going to talk about a little bit of everything, but I want to start off with um you know, what's, what's your story? Like, really, give, <laughs> and, and give us the, the, the abbreviated version, because everyone has, like, yeah, in fifth grade. But give me the abbreviated version, and ultimately, what drew you into, like, English, humanity, literary criticism, things of that nature? Um, okay. So, I'm from Compton, and uh, I'm the uh, second of seven children. My father was a gambler, and my mother was a mother. And <laughs> so uh, I grew up listening to uh, adult language, blue language. I come from cussing women. I said that in the documentary uh, in our mother's gardens. And I always loved the way black people could bend words and how they express themselves uh, differently. Um, there was always a polite way of saying something. There was never a a churchical way, because we didn't really, we weren't, we were very secular. I always say I've never, I never saw any of my grandmothers in church. That's not who those women were. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I always like to turn out a phrase and, uh, and I, I love profanity. I loved everything about language. I loved how language could be soft. I loved how language could be hard. I loved how language could be hurtful, how language could be healing. So I just went and began to study uh, the word uh, very early on, uh, even before reading about Malcolm X's um, falling in love with the dictionary. I used to climb the tree and spend the whole day in my yard in Compton with the dictionary, starting with aardvark and just going through the dictionary, just familiarizing myself with words and their origins and how they and their travels, the yeah. travel of words. So I really like etymology, mm -hmm. where words originate, those sources, and I liked um, honest. Uh, um, Automastics, um, the study of the science of naming, especially as it related onomastics, as it relates to black people and some of the different kind of names that we have that, like, if you go to Six Flags or Magic Mountain or Hershey's Park, you're not going to get your name on a keychain <laughs> or, or uh, a t-shirt because they don't have Qu uh, Quinesia there. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I, I, I was always, uh, I was always looking at chronicling black women's naming patterns, speech patterns. And I majored in speech pathology and audiology undergraduate. And I did linguistics. So I became involved in the word, um, on some scientific ways first, like where it's produced in the brain, um, the Broca area that causes speech to occur, mm -hmm. damage to it, which causes speech to disappear. So I became aware of language's power in presence and its power in absence. So that's the short. And just love storytelling. Just love to hear my grandmother, who had 11 husbands, seven divorces for annulments tell stories about the men who that she, the men she loved and the men that loved her and the men she left and the men that left her so uh, so just narrative so yeah. that's the short of it thank you <laughs> that's 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 great i mean just like words i was i was a kid that uh we we had the um in the basement we would have all of these books that we inherited, right? The wouldn't be like book books, like 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 literature or anything along those lines. It was more so like 
manuals. Like, here's the encyclopedia, here are the dictionaries. And uh-huh. that's what I would go in the basement. This is how I like, learned, like, oh, this is what this animal is? Great. And I would just skim through it. That was something that I enjoyed. And I believe that like Encyclopedia Britannica maybe is still in my mom's basement. Yeah. And that that was the thing. So I definitely kind of connected with, I'm going to this tree and going from aardvark to zoology. This is what we're doing today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, words matter. And politically, I became a word, aware that words matter. Um, when I was nine and I went to the pool for swimming at the uh, Linwood pool and we lived in Compton and my mother dropped all of us off and we were going for a day of swimming and when we got there the white woman said oh I'm sorry we don't allow Negro boys and girls in our pool and then I wanted to know what a Negro was because I had never really heard the word and my grandmother said it was a long word that meant no. It begins with an N and ends with an O. It means no, you can't have, no, you can't be, no, you can't say, no, you can't go. No, just, uh, just a whole, it sets you up for a whole level of interdictions, like, you know, addictions, like you cannot, n- not allow you. And so, that word, you are a Negro, just those words, just, you are, just four words, or mm-hmm. you are, uh, enslaved, three words, could change your whole reality, how your, your body moves in space and time, and the power that people had to make those words, um, those words that were you, or represented you, mm-hmm. make them like like bars and prisons and bounds boundaries that you couldn't cross. No, we don't allow Negro boys and girls in our pool. Mm-hmm. So that was age nine. Mm-hmm. So like those words, I was I was aware of, of words and their possibilities, and in and in their and words as punishment. Mm-hmm. Work. I think, like, at least from my vantage point, I guess, words can lead to behavioral changes. Like, you'll see it in times where it's like someone may say something, something that is just like, okay, that was a little rough or whatever. And it elicits a response of, I'm going to punch you in the mouth now. And that, that I always found that weird because I'm I'm not inclined to go in that direction, but we always kind of like just generally we're not giving words there words mean something words have importance but we try to trivialize them until someone literally as you're saying yeah. no words words and, and it can this. be subtle cuz it, it words are nuanced and the words are historical and words come from spaces so it, you could be in baltimore and you could go on uh to mom's organic market and the the way that the person the intonation of the person asking whether or not you have bags, did you mm-hmm. bring bags? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be confrontational. Do you have a bag? Or oh, you don't have a bag. And then becomes like a, a projection, tree killer, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, anti-conservationist. Um, I'm doing my part as a white woman. Well, first of all, so then I have to go to history None of my people ever cut down these trees. None of my people ever decimated the forest in their 500-year contact on Turtle Island and in, in these indigenous lands. Yeah. So I have to go as far, and it's just really bizarre for me that I have to do kind of a microcosmic overview of all history. Mm-hmm. Now, don't ask me for a fucking bag unless you're ready to get a lesson. Yeah. You don't see a bag. I don't have a bag. Yeah. Move on. Yeah. Like, where am I going to pull this out from? Like, right, what are you, like, what are you right, right, me? right. So, <laughs> but, but, um, the idea of anything, even something that's seemingly innocuous, did yeah. you bring any bags today? <laughs> could become, do you see a bag? Yeah. It's like, use, use your eyes. You have two of them. Uh, or yeah. say it, or or present it in a different yeah. way, or whatever. But I always have 
I always have an alert on, especially when you go in economic spaces where you're crossing class lines. So you're not only (laughs) crossing racial lines, you're crossing racial and class lines. This this cereal is eight ninety eight a box. What your ass still coming up in his motherfucker for? (laughs) So there's that too. Yeah, yeah. When I when I I hope we can say that. No, okay, good. We we keep we keep it authentic here. Okay. When when I go up there, I like, I like to go to Wegmans, right? And when I go up there, I have people who are like, "Man, you like that bougie shit." I'm like, "No, I actually like vegetables. I, I like to get vegetables or what have you." And um, and I was like, eh, "They are they are only in the counties." Then I start doing that extra, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I definitely see that kind of class thing. Who's it for? Because I remember yeah. when that light rail was down out there. I was like, mm, I'm not supposed to come out here, am I? Ooh, I drove out here. Ooh. Right. And what I, you doing with a car, boy? And I, and I make sure I go there and I, I get like, I take up space. I'm just being just, just kind of ignorant. <laughs> and I love it. I was like, yeah, so y'all got any extra sushi over here? And I say it really aggressively. <laughs> Mm-mm. I know, it just, I, I don't know. It's like these words help m- make you perform make you perform different identities or reach for something in your Batman utility kit, that tool kit that you have around your waist. I was like, oh, we playing the conservationists. We're conservationists. Y'all waste this game. Let me tell you something about history and the destruction of everything. Every forest cut down. I was just reading uh, Touch the Earth, a compilation of essays by uh, indigenous people. And one of the one of the stories that one of the recurring narratives are about people who cut trees down for no reason. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a tree that sometimes is cut down for a totem, but most times they will look to see if there was something that nature felled uh, through a lightning strike or yeah. something else or something else that happened. But they will search that out first before they cut a tree down or that which makes the structures for the uh, the housing units, uh, branches and limbs that the wind has given up, the wind as a natural element. So there's this really, really respect for the exchange of things. And if you have to take something, offer some tobacco, leave a sacred offering on the mm-hmm. ground to the energies that that provided this for your to show your gratitude. So there's practicing of gratitude. Is this not chainsaws and Bill, we gotta clear this by four thirty on Friday. I need two shifts in. <laughs> and then everybody's chainsawing and 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 you know, wreaking havoc havoc. And so along the way mm-hmm. I'm very sensitive to what indigenous people feel on um, on this planet that this this land that we walk on here in 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 Maryland uh, North America with the Eastern Band Cherokee some other groups of people that are here and how we walk on that land as without paying homage uh, to who they were and what this land was before it became Mary's land, Mm -hmm. the only Catholic colony among the 13, and the home of Catholicism for uh, what was then called British North America. And um, so I'm always uh, aware of how they respect the land. And uh, Jack Forbes in his book, uh, um, Columbus and Other Cannibals, I'm going to repeat the title, Jack Forbes, uh, he's, I think he's an Ojibwe, uh, one of the, um, Sioux groups. I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but it's called, uh, Columbus and Other Cannibals. And he speaks about the Wetiko and the Wetiko disease, which is a kind of, uh, planetary schizophrenia where you destroy the environment and you destroy things. So he gives the analogy in his, uh, preface. The rape of a land and the rape of a people are the same act. The rape of an idea, the, you know, the exchange. He goes into all of these horrible behaviors that post themselves as nation building mm-hmm. and, um, forward progress and 
what the indigenous people see as a total disrespect uh, for the land. So we have to get to a moment of people having it as a news feed item, a climate accord, you know, finally when they pulled out of all of the Paris talks and all of the other attempts of the other people in the whole world that share the same planet, mm -hmm. um, the disdain for the land. And so for me, I think... Um, I, I write right now, even though I, I write on spiritual things, I center the dance. I center dance as one of the spiritual uh, sonic uh, gestures that along with the music and the dance as both both of those sonic forces mm -hmm. in the way that black people tap their feet, whether it's Baltimore club dancing which is really going at a high vibrational frequency. It's going real, real fast yeah. uh, to touch the ground and to stomp the ground. Uh, look at the sacral, the resacralization of the land by dancing on it, by celebrating on it in the mm -hmm. midst of all of the, the chaos that surrounds us to um, have the ability to dance. And so I'm looking at dance as a way to sacralize the earth and to be a part of it, to touch the earth, to bind with the earth. And so whether it's hyphy or crunk, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. If it's go -go or away. house, <laughs> it wouldn't matter. Praise dancing in the, in the sanctuary. It wouldn't matter. Yeah. Black people tap in the earth and, you know, maintaining a certain vibrational set of frequencies, whether they're sonic or for like black people, the sonic is always for movement and performance of movements, you know. So I'm thinking about, so that's where, I, where I'm going now in my creative practices mm -hmm. is always centering dance and motion and movement, especially since uh, there are forces out there that entertain the notion of the non-moving mm -hmm. body. Hmm. The non-moving black body. That's the only one that's not threatening. That's the only one <laughs> that has the situation under control. And um, so to circle back to my childhood, I was a dancer. I was a little dancing girl who danced for money. And um just want to read part yeah. of the preface uh, to this book. Please. Because although it's a scholarly book, I have a preface titled Dancing Between Two Realms. And um, here's a epigraph from um, Langston Hughes. Make a drum beat, put it on a record, let it whirl, and while we listen to it play, dance with you till day. And it's from Langston Hughes' poem, Jukebox Love Song. In one of my earliest recollections of myself, I am dancing. Yes, when I was young, I was that little dancing girl. On various holiday occasions, when my friends' relatives would visit them, they would send for me saying, Go get that little dancing gal. Honoring their requests, I would perform dances such as Mickey's Monkey, accompanied by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. As the 45 RPM record circle clockwise around the record player's turntable. Over the years, I danced Marvin Gaye's Hitchhike, Archie Bell and the Drills Tighten Up, the Capitol's Cool Jerk, the Orlans, the Wah Wah Tusi, and the Knickerbockers, Schwine Time. I especially look forward to the imported dances my junior aunt would show me upon her return to Los Angeles from her yearly summer trips to Chicago. Out on the dance floor, even though most of the dances I did were performed with one dance partner, there was a sense of community because of the collective performance of other dancers sharing the dance place, dance space. Wearing our favorite dance faces, mine was hanging my tongue out the side of my mouth while my sister's was biting her bottom lip. We chanted dance sounds, communicating a sense of well-being summoned from the energy and force manifested by the unity of music and movement. And I liked all the chants. The roof, the roof, <laughs> the roof is on fire. 
We don't need no water. Let the motherfucker burn. Burn, motherfucker. Or we are saying, shit, goddamn, get off your ass and jam. Or we would say, there's a party over here. Ooh, ooh. And we would just be, it, it's like, it was like black Pente- Pentecost, black people in one space on one accord doing something, something out of the purview of whiteness, something mm. out of the control of white space, something we didn't have to mimic and copy that they did. Miley Cyrus <laughs> has never been asked by Beyonce to show me a couple of steps. <laughs> now I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so I want to ask you this. Uh, so in, in doing in doing the research or what have you, I, I always feel like I'm kind of internet stalking people. I'm like, all right, let me, let me dive into this and read about that. Um, so I read that you've, you've traveled the world from Compton to Cairo is what I read at a place, um, and extensive travel within Africa. Uh, so how, what has the role, and I think, and I think I know, but I'd rather ask you, how has the role of like travel been for you as a creator, as a storyteller, as a person, uh, as a citizen of the world? Because, you know, travel gives a different perspective. So tell me about yeah. that. I started traveling early. Even if I just even say traveling through Compton, hitchhiking, going, to, uh, standing on a freeway, trying to get a ride to Beverly Hills to get a haircut from the Vidal Sassoon Salon in Brentwood over there where uh, OJ and, LJ and them used to stay. I don't know where they stay at now, but just hitchhiking on the freeway. I met my first husband hitchhiking. In fact, my first husband is who I went to... Uh, traveled with uh, for three months the summer of uh, 1973. And, um, yeah. And so we traveled through uh, to Brussels, Belgium, and then we hitchhiked to Paris. And then from Paris, we just hitchhiked um, down to Pamplona for the running of the bulls for the Festival of San Fermin, where they let the bulls out in the street and people run and get killed and whatever. Back up through France, uh, then to Italy, then through uh, Yugoslavia, just all over the place traveling. The thing I loved about traveling early on is was that I could speak in another language that mm. was not the one that shaped all of the way I, I thought, because I understood from studying language that language shapes thought. And so to untether, when I found that when I traveled, I could untether myself from the restrictions or limitations of what a little black girl from Compton, California could do or to know or to be. So I can remember my high school teacher, who was my Latin teacher, uh, ninth grade, and then she was my 10th, 11th, 12th grade French teacher, sister uh, Mary Hubert Singleton from New Orleans, Louisiana. We had uh, nuns from New Orleans that instructed us for the 12 years of school. We we set, we brought them from New Orleans to Compton. and Because Compton is basically like a space where people that are from Louisiana, right. primarily Lu- New Orleans, live. And... Um, so she had been educated at the Sorbonne in Paris, and she had told me in the 10th grade, oh, take a language to speak it, not to pass the test. <laughs> pass, you know, speaking it will yeah. give you that. So I could I could be in Belgium, and they speak both uh, uh, kind of a Germanic, Flemish kind of uh, Belgian uh, Germanic language, and they also have French as well. And I could be everywhere, and I could speak French, and everybody could understand me, and I could understand everybody. And so it started me in 1973 at 19 to um, want to travel everywhere and try to get into the linguist to, to change the code, to get into the linguistic code of whatever language they were speaking in whatever country I was in. I lived in Cairo, Egypt, Mm -hmm. 1995, 1996, and um, they were speaking Arabic. (laughs) You know, I get there the first day and get into my 10-word-a-day program. 
go straight, go left, go right, yeah. stop, I'm hungry. You know, just get into your what we call sufficient uh, language. In whatever language, I don't care if they're speaking Tamachek when I was living, when I was in Timbuktu, uh, Mali, uh, whether they speak in, um, Pular, if I'm among the Fulani of Senegal and Mali and other places, I don't care what anybody was speaking. I could crack the code for a good a hundred words mm. and participate every day in language with the people in their language to show them the respect that I had and not an imposition on what y'all don't speak English here? What the hell is going on here? That's, that's a very yeah, so American I was vibe. All, yeah, <laughs> so I always had access to language and I loved I um from a, a artistic perspective, I love this dissembling, this changing changing words, changing self, mm -hmm. performing a different reality based on the context of these words that I know and things I can say, and then just studying the patterns of intonation of, for those words so that my pronunciation would just be impeccable mm. on those couple of words that I had, that if people didn't know, they'd say, oh, and Ding Nolof? <laughs> wow, wow. Ding Nolof, tutti, tutti. No, Ding a Bubach. And then I, it, it wouldn't matter if they would, it wouldn't matter the structure of it. If I could know the structure, hmm. I could crack the code. Hmm. And that's what studying linguistics did. Gave me structure. Hmm. Like, oh, nobody imports words for things that they need basic to themselves. So those are all indigenous words. Yeah. So the fact that they don't have any words for orphan in any indigenous African language means it's not conceptual mm. that a person could be without people somewhere that could take care of them. So it's really philosophical. You see what's in language. You see how many words you have to have in the vocabulary. And you'll see a complexity that it's kind of... A, like English has a lot of words, mm -hmm. and all the technological words are coined in English. So other people will talk about gigabytes, and they'll be uh, talk about you know algorithms and different kinds of things. But um, other people just have the words that they need. Yeah, yeah. like like, and I don't know how much truth is to it, but I remember this this idea that I think in Japanese there's see the good. Or it's bad, excellent, or it's bad. It's nowhere. It's no middle point. It's no. Yeah, it was all right. That's uh -huh. something we have. Uh -huh. That's something we use here. It's either you got it right or you didn't. There's mm -hmm. no. It's very binary in that sense. Yeah. And my, I, I think that's why that kind of achievement thing is baked in and culturally. It's like, no, I, I got to do this. This is what I have to do. This is what my my job is. And I have to do this well. Mm -hmm. I have to excel at this, mm -hmm. or otherwise I failed. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I gave a half effort. That right, was good enough. Right. There's no such thing. No, that, that mediocrity and, and mediation. But it's all, you know, it's all, um, that's really interesting. I never thought about it until this moment about the Jesus cult and Jesus being a mediator between God and the Holy Spirit in this, in its, in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. So that mediator middle position of being a, the linguists between uh, the interlocutor is what they would call it in speech, talking for someone, speaking for someone, um, that middle ground. And um, it's really it's really important. Um, Greek mythology always has the rubric of following the golden mean, not being like Daedalus. Flying too high, mm -hmm. flying too low. It's like something in the middle. And whereas in the African uh, cosmology, the middle is the only place that exists because that's the engine for the other two sides mm -hmm. to function. Yeah. The break. So when you get to hip hop, it's the break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 that's the whole thing the thing that disrupts it the, the, then you can bring it back to loop but it's that break 
it's it's embedded, and that's why yeah, the break beat all of it. Yeah, that's why these kind of like conversations that are with people when it comes to like culture. It's like, oh, you can't just pass this along. We we kind of know these things. They're they're embedded. Yeah. They're 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 passed down. And they're almost in. I, I would say at this level, if anything, data capacity storage and storage that that even genetically things take on a DNA that are cultural, mm. that, that people don't really talk about it a lot, about cultural DNA in the same way as they deal with blood DNA, like uh, trying to find a cross and type match for a, uh, organ um, transplanting. or But there is a cultural DNA as well that resides in giving a certain importance to the beat. It's mm. not important to everybody, apparently, because you don't know if they're dancing to the words or the... the couldn't be the beat. Mm. Must be dancing to the words because it's, it's off the beat. Mm. And um, But the beat, that one beat that Bob Marley sung about, we feel it in the one drop, that one... That foot on that, you know where that foot needs to be. And I could remember going to places where I didn't know the traditional dances of the place. But once the drums told me what was possible yeah. and I understood the beats of the drum, I knew where my body had to be placed and where my foot had to be on when that beat came up where that right foot had to be. And that's an important, that's an important um, characteristic and it's linguistic in that way if you want to deal with like a higher science mm -hmm. of somatics and how the body can heal itself and align itself with certain uh, frequencies and sonic vibrations to heal itself through body uh, placement mm -hmm. and, and that's why the dancing is I'm um, come back to always the dancing it because your your body could remember what your your mind or your or or your 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 mental forgot you know it's just like when brothers pour uh, libations on the ground for the deceased mm -hmm. or for the homies that's not here they're not really saying I'm performing an African traditional libation ceremony, yeah, yeah. which honors this a ritual. They don't have to have it on that level to understand why they're doing it, but the performance is everything that they are doing it. And that first, you know, open that, open that top first mm -hmm. go on the concrete that, that they remember that and that they do it. So the dance is the performed sonic, uh, a uh, 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 attestation to a certain sonic agreement, mm -hmm. you know, like there's a tune that I got. I'm all right now. I don't know if you get like this, but you get into a tune and that kind of aligns you on a spiritual chiropractic for the day. Mm -hmm. Some people use a gospel song. Yeah. You know, it just depends, and it changes. You yeah. know, it has. You know, it could have a short shelf life. You know, you could be. I get, I get caught on those, those, yeah. those kind of like those earbuds. Just like, yeah, I'm gonna listen to this. This is what this week is gonna be, yeah. and it's, it's, it, this, this is. Um, I think when you said chiropractic, I, I think regenerative. Yeah, it's like yeah, I'm reset. getting, yeah, I'm getting something out of this. This works for me right now. Sometimes it might be. I remember this song from a local guy, um, Eulogy, and it was this song, Snakes. And it was just like the right energy. And I was just like, I'm taking down all of this shit. That, that was kind of the vibe I, know, I had. I know. Yeah. I had one like that. How I knew it was time to retire from copping. Uh -huh. I couldn't go into the parking lot without pressing mm. it on <laughs> Kendrick Lamar, spiteful chant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Too many bitches and not <laughs> enough hoes. And most of these niggas is acting like hoes, like a hoe. <laughs> anyway. So. I, I, that was like, that could, that could motivate me. That could, that could motivate, that could motivate me. Or at one point I was obsessed with, uh, elevators by Outkast. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, once upon a time, not long ago, but look, we like me, wait, we say, 
me and when me and my nigga rode the martyr through the hood. <laughs> now every day we look up at them ceilings, trying to catch that feeling off of instrumentals. Had my pencil plus my paper. We caught the eighty six Lithonia, headed to Decatur, writing rhymes, trying to find out a spot up in that light. Light up in that spot. <laughs> and just the aspirational motivation of two dudes, you know, mm. in the hook. Me and you, the <laughs> yeah. collective communal things, because it's communal. Yeah. Me and you, your mama and your cousin too, riding on strips on Vogue's, <laughs> coming up slamming Cadillac doors, and then the repetition, because that is a nuanced black thing, the amount of repetition mm -hmm. that occurs in a song. You know, and and it could be fatic. It doesn't even have to have. We talked about how words matter. Yeah, yeah. But it could be fatic speech where, like la 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 means I love you. Yeah, yeah. Or Earth, Wind, and Fire singing body ya, body ya, body ya, di ya, di ya, di ya, di ya. Ba -dum -ba -dum -ba, ba -dum -ba -ba, ba -dum -ba -ba. And it just makes me think of scatting and other alternate linguistic things that black people could get into to deny the privilege of English to mm. master their tongue and control it. So the miasma of Aretha Franklin turning a one-syllable word into a 16-syllable <laughs> word yeah. when she's singing Amazing Grace. Yeah. How zing has like nine syllables in it <laughs> yeah, yeah. after you already had the 30 in a maze, right? <laughs> but so yeah, we just get, we get, we get in something and we hold the groove. We, mm -hmm. and so that's what I would, I would, I would say that when it's a one nation under a groove, getting mm -hmm. down just for the funk of it, just one nation and we're on the move. Nothing can stop us now. That's on the one beat. That's Parliament Funkadelic. Mm -hmm. And that's what they call the funk beat. Mm -hmm. It's on the one. That's the one that disco tried to disrupt because it was so everybody. You could be somewhere and everybody could get on the dance code on the dance floor and, and generate a certain corporate unity of body movement and sound mm -hmm. that. Is almost like it has the ability to create a portal. And it makes me think about the ghost dance, getting back to the Native yeah. American. Now, the ghost dance was a dance that was done, um, if you want to Google it real quick, um, that's how Sitting Bull actually died after all of his whole life. They were concerned that he was doing, he was part of the ghost dance movement. Mm -hmm. And this is an all-nation dance, meaning that this counterclockwise dance it, that incorporated all of these different groups of people, uh, they believe that the proper practice of dance, this proper practice of dance would bring, I said, ex um, it would help to end American westward expansion, mm -hmm. bring peace, prosperity, and unity to Native American peoples throughout the region and help them. So it's Jack Wilson, uh, this Northern Palut spiritual uh, leader. His name is Vovoka, his other name. The proper practice of this dance would reunite the living with the dead. And so I began to write about the electric slide as having that same potential as the ghost dance mm -hmm. for black people and not looking at it as a line dance, but looking at it as a four 90 degree turn mm -hmm. uh, counterclockwise movement of people, just like all of the Haitian dances are counterclockwise to to worship the vo the, the spirits of the of the Vodou. And the pattern of counterclockwise dancing in the ring shout of African Americans, little Sally Walker, ring games of little girls, brown girl in the ring, that we just keep dancing these four points starting on uh, the vertical line called the Kalunga line. Mm -hmm. You begin at midpoint and you trace three steps to the right 
come back to the center point on that line, uh, take three steps to the left, come back to the center point, march three steps to the back, come back to the center point, go three steps to the forward to Takula where it's red, bend down, pick up the energy from low, stand back up, make a quarter turn to Lavumba, which is white and death, and this sacred dance of birth, puberty, marriage, death, reinforcing the cosmological understanding of people. They used to draw this sign on the ground to make an oath between black people and shake on it. That would be their word. They would draw that. So this Dekanga Dia Congo, like our like the ghost dance, is a dance that black people do. And they have variations, the Cupid Shuffle, this one, the that one, the Wobble. But you're always are trying to go mm. counterclockwise, retracing this uh this kind of cosmogram to show that you have not abandoned who you are in in your being, even though you've been a stranger in a strange land. Mm-hmm. Uh with the with now the anti critical race theory people in in uh Texas are trying to change all the history books to say involuntary migration mm-hmm. and take the word uh enslavement or slavery out. Yeah. So uh, t- to make white kids not feel bad that their people treated others with such a brutality as to kidnap and captive them, um, cap- uh, make them captives. So that the sanitization of language, going back to that, yeah. in involuntary migration, well, that sounds like three Negroes on a field trip with backpacks, <laughs> backpacks going across the Middle Passage. My, my thing is always, say what you mean. You know, that, yes. that's the thing. It's like, yeah. are, we, are we doing it? And, uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, and that's the thing, like... Um, they they'll use servant. It's like no 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 no. That's that's not that's not that actually no, at all. No, uh, it's yeah. it's different things, and it's like you we we do the sanitization. That's the thing that really kind of got my goat, as it were. When I want to say back in twenty twenty, you know, oh. right after George Floyd, and, and and we'll wrap on this. We'll wrap on yeah. this um, because I feel like this is just like the tip of the iceberg. But I, I do want to go back yeah. to that point of of the sanitization. Where, in, in terms of pop culture, in terms of people in news and so on, just how we consume things. Mm-hmm. There have been a lot of goofy, weird things that have a racial bent to it, that have a sexist, that have a home of all of the things. Every, the, all the things. That and then things, yeah. we, we want to go, oh, let's just take this out. No, keep it in there, sit in it. Yeah. However, if you want to feel, feel something about it, give it that disclaimer. Use more words, actually. Mm -hmm. Give it a disclaimer of, we thought this shit was cool then. My bad. That's better than saying, oh, let's just scrub it. Right. Because when you scrub it, you're not acknowledging it. It's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. It's, it's, It's a thing that all of the men who used to speak out against America are now on postage stamps like <laughs> Malcolm X, uh-huh. um, Muhammad Ali, Paul Robeson. I'm thinking about how mm-hmm. Paul Robeson took his passport and he couldn't travel and that they were just having technology of sound recording and he sent his speech that he was going to deliver in Oslo, Norway or wherever he was going. He sent it ahead as a voice recording. Um, uh, Shauna Redman, who is a critic who's at uh, Columbia now, she just came from being at USC and UCLA, but Shauna Redman has a book called Anthem, but she does work on Paul Robeson. It's like the dead, the, the, the dead, but men with strong voices are all on postage stamps, but while they were embodied in their bodies, mm-hmm. uh, their ability to to speak and to speak truth to power was uh, was surveilled and um, policed and monitored and disrupted. And so, you know, it really is. You know, I to to speak is. Uh, to speak is a big thing. To know words is a big thing. To tell stories is a big thing. To tell your own authentic story is a big thing. And I love D. Watkins' title for, I think it was his third book, We Speak for Ourselves, that you only, 
you you have to you have to be able to control the story and control the narrative so that when you tell the story this is of what happened and so that was the one thing really big after um enslavement uh, a lot of the narratives were written when they could talk about what had happened to them on those in those death camps mm-hmm. and and to give voice to their story. So that's our first real big literature are the narratives. I was uh, Frederick Douglass. I was yeah. born in 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 Talbot County, Tuckahoe, Talbot County, Maryland. Of my father, it was rumored. My mother was Harriet Bailey, and he tells his story up into the point of him being liberated in his 1845 uh, narrative. But the, the freedom to tell your story is to say that this happened, that you won't forget it because mm-hmm. there are so many good lessons. Like you said, you said this, let's handle this mm-hmm. and you, we, can, we, we can talk about how this is terribly wrong and how this is a microaggression. You cut, you, you, you cut short there on the opportunity for discourse, yes. for an opportunity to say, oh, okay, why was this wrong? Why is this oh, insensitive? Yes. Because, you know, let's say benefit of the doubt, which eh, they know better. But let's say benefit of the doubt. You or had doubt n- that they benefit. <laughs> that's me. But, go ahead. but it's like, oh, well, you didn't know. OK, cool. Fine. If that's the truth that you're going with, let's rock with it. Now, here's an opportunity to learn, to be informed. Oh, no, no. We just don't want to feel bad about it. Oh, so it's, all, it's, it's emotionality. That's just one of the things that uh, the lady, uh, the young uh, what's I can't think of her name, but um, she does something where if something happens horrible to black women or black people and a white person wants to come in and make it all about them, I feel so bad. And like, if you have to cry, go out. This is not about you, right? No, all eyes, all, you're not the <laughs> default drive yeah. to sucking up the attention in the room. This mother, you. this mother just lost her child. So yeah. you go out there and, and Karen and you handle your, your emotionality. Yeah. And we, but meanwhile, we're going to get back to, comforting um, this bereaved mother. And um, so those are microaggressions where you even take the moment and suck the air out of the room and be like a Jennifer Hudson. What about what I want? <laughs> what about me? So, so in, in this, in these last few minutes here, because I, I, I we, we both got our things, and uh, we do, we gotta and, go. And, and this, and this has been, this has been like great, and this has been, you know, much different from. <laughs> No, in, 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 in the best way possible, much different from, it's just, hey, I got a question. Hey, you got an answer. And so I, 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 I really do appreciate that. And I appreciate, yeah. you know, that, that, that you indulging me and being open and having this conversation. But I can't let you go without asking you some rapid fire questions. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm ready, Betty. All right. So they should have named me Betty. Yeah, so, you know, you want to hit, you want to hit these as quickly as I'm possible. Go, I'm going to go quick. I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the five, the five word, the okay. five word story on it. Uh, favorite country you visited? Mali, Mali, West Africa. Now this is this is going to be a hard one for you, I think. Maybe it won't be. What is the most powerful word in the English language or otherwise? What what is the powerful word that comes to mind for you? Because you're a linguistics person, I, I had to I, I had to put this one in as we were talking. I like words, like the most powerful word. Yeah, it comes to mind for you. I like. I like the word yes. Okay. I like the word, and I like it in all the languages. Wow, and yeah, I like I like in 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 uh, Wolof is you say wow like wow 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 like W O W is yes wow wow wow. <laughs> and then if you think about it, there was no English word that had wow before the enslavement of African people. Wow is not in any dictionary. Huh. So that a lot of times language that other people have. Are our words too? Yeah. So wow, yes. And so I like the idea of yes, because if you look at Negro is a sh- long word for no. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go with the yes, the world in which every you tell yourself yes, because mm-hmm. everybody else is telling you no, and then you just yes yourself right into your best possibilities and your best life. I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Um, this is the last one I got for you. <laughs> What is your fondest memory of Baltimore? Because that's where we're at. We're we're here. We're in the city, and in that that same vein as you mentioned earlier. Oh, I like I like the community thing. I like when I had a welfare case, 
and I had my food stamps, and I was living on another side of town, and the place I was getting my food stamps, they came in the neighborhood, the social worker was going to come to that spot where I didn't live. <laughs> and and the day that she arranged to come, it was over my aunt, my husband's aunt house. And they said, well, do you know this little boy? And then everybody, oh, they said, everybody know Hollywood. That's a badass little boy. He run up and down this street, Hollywood. And my son was with me. They were like, Hollywood, because we had come from California. So everybody on that street called my son Hollywood. So if you get a nickname, see, this yeah. is what I'm telling you. What they know you around here, you got credentials. Are you a tourist? Are you supposed to be here? <laughs> Baltimore will always, the stop snitching in Baltimore, it's a, it's a real thing. And so I like the fact that's my fondest memory of Baltimore, how the community of women held me down and I didn't miss a food stamp because <laughs> uh, they vouched that they knew me and they knew my son. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> this, this is what happens when black people stick together and create community one block at a time. Yeah. And anybody was trying to see me hungry with a baby. I love it. So. I think that's where we'll stop at. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Welfare fraud in Baltimore. Okay. <laughs> well, <it's, it's, laughs> yeah, 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 sister did what she had to do. Yeah, statue of limitations. Yeah, statue of limitations. <laughs> I didn't murder man. I didn't murder anybody. I didn't carry a weapon across the state line. Okay. So there you have it, folks. <laughs> I want to, I want to again thank uh, Dr. Coco Zabito Selassie <laughs> for coming on to the podcast. And, thank uh, you. You're welcome. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, community, words. Words matter. Yes. You've got to look for them. Yeah, and you got to know some. You got to say some. <laughs>